So, thank you everyone for tuning in to another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transportation. Um, now, um, if you're seeing this on YouTube, uh, you already know the topic, um, or via social media on Twitch. Uh, it's not going to be two hours of dunking on China boosters, but rather, I do want to talk about the myth of... Uh, uh, autocratic or especially totalitarian efficiency when it comes to trains. Good evening, the court. Um, and, but, uh, uh, and that's going to be mostly me talking about uh, rail and regime type and the, the impact of regime type on uh, the transportation system in the country. But um, there is a little bit of, I don't want to call it a historiography there, that there is the historic myth of fascist efficiency uh, which is not in Russia, or which is not regarding Russia or China. Um, in fact, I don't think there has ever been any myth uh, attached to Russian efficiency. Um, Chinese efficiency, yes. Um, there are, I mean, China does do th uh, many things efficiently, but um, the more I'm looking at it, the more, uh, I shouldn't say I'm looking at it, too. we are looking at it, this is very much transit cost project. The transit cost project uh, issue um, is that China is actually a very ordinary place when it comes to building trains if uh, your baseline is non English speaking first world democracies. So, if uh, I were to tell you that, uh, yes, I'm the only person, who, okay, so first of all, the expression Soviet triangle comes from me. Uh, Second, we can talk. I, I do want to talk about the historiography a bit, a bit, a bit uh, because there is a little bit of a myth of Soviet efficiency, but not about infrastructure, as far as I know. Um, and, um, but anyway, if uh, you were to tell me that there is a country that is rather like the non English speaking uh, European countries that I'm familiar with, or like Japan, or South Korea, or like Taiwan, uh, and this country. Uh, were the, the scale of a continental superstate, uh, like the United States, but uh, with a much larger population, and you asked me to make some inferences about what a public transportation system would look like, um, I might actually be able to retrodict China from that. Uh, like China, um, China to the, so to the extent there are differences between China and the non-English speaking first world, uh, they're real, but often they're completely random bits of uh, uh, just planning tradition, uh, or it's just China's bigger. Um, so for example, uh, I have done multiple videos um, complaining about the uh, weak cross-border rail within Europe. So within Europe, we have a bunch of pretty strong uh, national intercity rail networks. Uh, the one that is best known uh, outside Europe is the French TGV, TGV network, the, the French uh, LGV network, uh, TGV is the train, LGV is the line. Uh, Spain is a little bigger actually, Spain has a slightly longer network of high speed lines buoyed by uh, its very low construction costs and also its abominable geography for this. The system in Spain is that there's a bunch of uh, cities and they, and they all ring and they're all in the margin of the country because they're mostly on the uh, or close to the water and then Madrid is in the is in the middle. So it practically no case can you put two distinct cities on a straight line to Madrid. I think this is the main exception. Barcelona, Zaragoza, uh, and then Madrid. Um, I guess maybe uh, Cordova and Sevilla, but then but, but then Malaga is uh, is a branch, um, and so uh, but but the ridership in Spain is much weaker. Um, so we have these the, the Spanish, the French, the German network, the Italian, uh, the British, um, and um, the, the the Swiss, the Dutch, which are much more optimized for their small sizes, but then. Cross-border rail is just not that bad. Um, there, there are always gaps in the high-speed lines. The exception when there is an all-high-speed route, it's uh, uh, Paris to Brussels, uh, or either of them to London. But um, the border uh, 
theater on the British side slows things down, and also these trains are atypically expensive, and everywhere else there are low speed gaps between Belgium and the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany, France and Germany, uh, Germany and Switzerland. Um, uh, the line, the, the connections between Germany and Switzerland are very good, um, because the connections go very positive, and there's no direct thing to the city. Um, I mean, there's Munich, there's mentioned to city, but it's not a very fast line. Um, and, uh, likewise, the, the lines going to Czechia kind of suck. Um, there, the, uh, there's no, like, so you would expect that based on the shared language between Germany and Austria, the very similar planning traditions, very uh, 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 tightly integrated economies, uh, there are no borders between them. You would expect that the train, that the rail network of Germany and Austria would, the border would be invisible, but it is sadly invisible. Like um, it works differently in Germany and Austria. Uh, um, so, it, so in Europe we have scale artifacts where cross-border rail just not very good. And um, but if you were to ask me, okay, let's pretend that uh, this were all one country with one planning, it would not look terribly different from China. Um, China essentially d does not have cross-border artifacts because. These are not cross-border trains. Um, so China, so one of the things I would like to, yes, the border is uh, high speed, but there is a gap between uh, Brussels and not that one, yes. Um, so, uh, so anyway, I, I want to go over the ordinariness of China. Uh, I want to go over uh, the regime type. So that is not just a two-way distinction between democracy and some kind of some kind of authoritarianism, but it's really a three-way distinction, or maybe a spectrum. Uh, so you have kind of on the one side, let's call them full democracies. Um, so things like kind of the core of first-world countries, uh, with a very notable exception of Singapore, which is at the exact other pole in a in a bunch of ways. Uh, the other pole would also have things like uh, Russia, China, Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, so these are very stably autocratic states. And then in the middle, there's something that is called anocracy, uh, which is uh, an is in like no, like it's not like there's one clear ruler where the ruler could be the collective demos or um, an autocrat or some kind of party state, but a lot of informality. And this is something that is typically the case in weak states. So Pakistan has a lot of features of anocracy because in Pakistan there are competitive elections. Um, there are ideological political parties, so traditionally it would be it's either a more secular left uh, in PPP or a more religious right with the Muslim League. Uh, and then there's generic populism with uh, uh, Imran Khan. Uh, but first of all, as we're, we're, we're seeing with Imran Khan and so on, I mean, the, the ability of the elected leaders to do things is constrained. They will get arrested if they piss too many people off. Um, in, in Pakistan, there's this very deep, uh, deep state uh, where big changes um, in, say, geopolitics uh, are not the pure purview of the elected government. The deep state, which in this case is the military and ISI, uh, has a say. Um, so if like all the top leaders pull in the same direction, so the elected leadership, um, ISI, the military pull in the same direction, then things can change. But essentially it means that it's a really bad vetocracy, like way too many veto points. Now the United States has atypically many veto points for uh, policy change. The United States does not have coups like Pakistan. And yes, I'm aware of January 6th of 2021. Not the same. Um, likewise, in, in Bangladesh, it's like a very informal sense of authoritarianism. Uh, Thailand, you got competitive elections, but we saw what happened to Pita and move forward. Um, so things like uh, like the kind of informality system of military coups. Uh, Turkey used to be like that. Turkey is now transitioning to a different kind of anocracy. Uh, not a nor. This is how it's called. Like I'm, I'm. This is not a term that I'm invented. Uh, does it, uh, does it, would that qualify as anocracy? Yeah, usually. Um, and remember that the countries that I uh, 
mentioned before as examples of uh, pure autocracy. These are not states where there is a risk of a military coup. Um, the Chinese uh, military, the, the PLA, uh, is not known to have any serious independence. Like I'm sure that it can argue. I mean, the, I'm sure it can argue for more funds and it argues over uh, where the funds are allocated, but. Um, the things that I've been reading, for example, for um, for example, for World War Three real research or just out of curiosity, never portray the PLA as uh, more of a deep state than any first world democratic military. Uh, because I mean, yeah, the, the United States military also has opinions. Uh, it even. Uh, engages in certain politicking, uh, for example, placing different uh, military installations uh, in different parts of the country to uh, uh, give every member of Congress uh, an incentive not to cut funding that is profoundly different from a deep state. Uh, and um, uh, now, the, the issue is that the anocracy form is never stable. Uh, it can go one way or the other. For example, uh, in Japan, Meiji Japan was autocratic. Uh, the uh, system there was that the uh, IJA and IGN were essentially immediate to the emperor, due to the Holy Roman Empire sons. Uh, and uh, the result was that uh, from the 20s onward, there was, not even the 20s, like even before, the, they did things that modern militaries don't do, like they would assassinate foreign leaders based on decisions made by field grade officers. Um, so it would be a strategic decision, but instead of the government saying, okay, we want to build an empire, and this leader is, uh, um, like in Korea, for example, uh, is an obstacle, we, we should kill the leader and seize the country. Again, this is like a high imperialism that is normalized behavior in the European state system, which Japan was by then part of. But that's not what they did. It was a local military commander who made that set uh, in Korea and uh, and again in Manchuria. Uh, and um, that led to military coups and assassinations within the country in the 20s and 30s, which uh, set the stage for World War II era totalitarianism. Uh, so that is an example of an anocracy becoming totalitarian. Now, an anocracy can, over time, become more democratic. Maybe the democratic institutions get stronger over time. I think this is what is happening in a, in a lot of Latin America, where um, uh, if where if you have a long enough if you have a long enough stretch with no coups, uh, and you just have normal elected politics of uh, left versus right, where you have yeah, I mean it's not going to be like first world efficiency or anything, but it's, it's this is sort of clientelism um, in, in Brazil, for example, that, um, yeah, it's worse than in Southern Europe, but it is something that is recognizable if you look at how things go in, let's say, Greece or Italy or, or, um, or Spain or Portugal. And so, so that is a regime type that is kind of sadly understudied um, because there's, I mean, I guess it's not as geopolitically important because usually anocracies are also kind of geopolitically weak. Uh, but um, the, but it is really important for internal political understanding. I, so I don't think most of the world lives in anocracies right now because China is not. India has some elements of it. I, I would traditionally I would just classify India as democratic, full stop. But the, they're arresting opposition leaders on flimsy pretexts, so just maybe not. Um, uh, but again, Pakistan, Bangladesh, most of Southeast Asia, because it would characterize Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia that way. Um, Iran is kind of weird because Iran is probably the only stable democracy that I'm aware of, just because it has a very mixed constitution, whereas usually it's just because the state is too weak to have its regime type. Uh, I would characterize Venezuela as anocratic. Um, Venezuela has a leadership that clearly wants to be authoritarian, but um, 
they were unable to do to a greater what China does to dissidents, for example. Um, so that's an example of state weakness. Uh, this also matters for um, for uh, and I should also add that I don't want to say all of Africa is like this because it's not like I know all of Africa, but a lot of the African um, regime examples I can see are kind of anachronic. Um It's either maybe an autocratic leader who's never as strong as Xi or Putin or MBS, um, or there are elections, but there's violence with every election, and um, they're never ideological political parties, it's all local interests. Um, and this leads to, for example, different kinds of human rights violations. So when we think of totalitarian human rights violations, let's put World War II aside for a moment, let's talk about modern things. Um, we can think about the modern Gulag system, again, not the Stalin era one, but the ones in like the um, later Soviet Union or what Putin is doing where um, regime opponents end up in prison and send them dead. Um, or the camps in uh, Xinjiang. Uh, or, uh, or even what MBS is doing to uh, Saudi elites um, with anti-corruption drives. I'm pretty sure all of them are corrupt, um, but I mean, it's, some corruption is tolerated based on what the regime wants, other is not. And in and all in all of these cases, it's targeted. It's targeted at anti-regime leaders. It's also something that's been notable uh, that's been noted in the Hong Kong protest movement that the cops in, in Hong Kong to preserve the, the regime against the protest movement they arrested leaders. Uh, they uh, compelled uh, maybe some confessions. Maybe they uh, uh, put the, the 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 leaders in prison for very long period of time. And here's what they did not do. They did not do very large massacres. They didn't need to. They have enough state capacity that they can do the targeted arrests. And this is something that anocracies struggle with, which is why we're seeing insane levels of police killings in, for example, the Philippines, um, or in Venezuela, or in, uh, or in Brazil, uh, or even in Egypt. Um, Egypt has a lot of forced disappearances. Um, and often it's completely random. Um, like they're not good at targeting the actual threats to the regime at home or abroad. Um, now, with this kind of, let's call it a spectrum, I'm not going to say three-way, but it's a spectrum uh, between, again, democracy and autocracy. We're in the middle of these democracies, and this also affects infrastructure and transportation because the point Yes, Botswana is exceptional. Uh, South Africa, I don't want to talk about it too much because my understanding is that right now there is, for the first time since the 90s, a threat to the ANC from within the black majority because previously, yeah, there was the opposition, there's the Democratic Alliance, but it's not a party that a lot of black people vote for. It's a party that you vote for if you're white or colored. Um, and South Africa is 80% black, so if you want to actually win elections, you need, I mean, you don't need a majority of the black vote, but you need very, to, to be very close to it. Um, um, yeah, and um, the, uh, with infrastructure in South Africa, it's terrible for other reasons, which are um, essentially carry over from apartheid, where um, the whole point of public transportation is one system for all. So this is something that if you believe in, let's say, ideological socialism, it's very easy to, to think about, to, to, to do, and um, not for nothing, there was a lot of investment in public transportation in the communist world, uh, because we are uh, we're socialists, uh, we're eventually going to switch to the, we're eventually, eventually going to transition to the communist stage where the state is going to wither away and the dictatorship of the proletariat will no longer be needed, but for now we're socialists. Uh, we have a dictatorship of the proletariat, which is building things for the, yes, exactly. So first of all, consumption suppression. This is something that you need a very strong state to be able to do, which could be democratic. Uh, Japan, uh, and to, a set, to an extent, Germany have done that. Germany, uh, it, Germany does not engage in consumption suppression today. This is a, a really important thing for um, 
Americans looking to analyze German politics. Uh, Germany engaged in consumption suppression in the 2000s and 2010s, maybe also in the 90s, that's un that I'm not certain about. Um, this was something that Americans criticized a lot in and after the Great Recession because uh, the consumption suppression uh, meant that German full employment relied on export, so someone else had to consume, but it was kind of moralized as consumption is bad in Germany. Uh, but anyway, that world is gone, and the same center-right uh, Austrians who were doing consumption suppression in the 2010s right now uh, are adopting an almost American mentality of uh, conspicuous consumption, especially of cars. It's kind of a way of saying fuck you to uh, the Greens more than anything else. And, um, and right, so to, to do consumption suppression, uh, for example, in order to grow, in order to build infrastructure, but not just infrastructure, not, not, not just what we think of as infrastructure like transportation or even building hospitals and schools, even just being able to invest private savings in building new factories as you industrialize, that requires um, either foreign investment or domestic investment. So, uh, foreign investment is always risky because the foreign investors will pull the money when it's inconvenient for you. This is called in development economics contagion. Uh, I don't think it affects the biggest players, by which I mean China and India, but it's something that affects even medium-sized even medium -sized players, where if one Latin American country has a crisis, foreign investors will look at... Uh, the rest of Latin America scans um, and might pull investment because they spread because they think that the contagion will spread. So it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. And um, so the kind of healthy way to, to industrialize is through domestic uh, capital. And if you're not a rich country, you need to build that capital through consumption suppression. Um, so how do you do it? You need a strong state to be able to do it. So if you're, uh, so if you're autocratic, let's say you're South Korea, you can just say, we govern for developmentalism, we govern for businesses that are generating growth, um, and it may require a lot of foresight if you're 1960s South Korea, it does not require that foresight if you're 1970s, early 80s South Korea, but then it's clear that the industry is growing. Uh, I don't think it requires that much of a leap of faith in poor countries today, um, but it requires governing for big institutions and not for local magnets. So the local magnets um, are the people who maybe uh, do a lot of consumption in order to show off how wealthy they are and also because maybe they have some kind of mentality of uh, uh, magnanimity so maybe they hire more and more servants and brag about how they're creating jobs for the poor uh, and, they're, and how nice they are to the servants. Uh, so that requires restraining their consumption, and yeah, the servants aren't going to have work as much work as servants for them. Instead, they're going to go to the factories, um, which is going to make the servants that have the best relationship with the magnates unhappy, um, and it's going to make the servants who are the most abused by the magnates maybe happier. But if you listen to the magnates, you're not going to listen to the most abused servants, um, and uh, that. Um, and again, you can do it if you're a strong autocratic set, you can just say, we're going to uh, save money, you don't like it, the, the secret police will have a conversation. But it can also happen equally in a democracy. Um, again, Germany managed to do so, not to extreme extent, like 1960s, 70s South Korea, or 1990s, 2000s China, um, but it didn't need to. Um, and again, Japan did the same thing in the 50s, 60s. Um, 70s. Uh, um, what it requires is a sense of social consensus. So in the case of Germany, in, or Northern Europe in general, by the way, it's not just Germany, and the Nordic countries are the same thing, is, um, a, so in this case it's union buy-in. So because of the strength of the democratic institutions here, because of the strength of the social institutions here, the unions could could be credibly promised to share in the bounty in, in the bounties of future growth. So uh, they engaged in wage restraint in the 90s and 2000s uh, with the understanding that they could 
during a strong economic time demand more, um, which is again not available, which is not a promise that is available to a country with um, with weaker labor, and in this case, uh, with weaker labor protections, with weaker unions than the norms. I, mean, I don't want to say in Germany to pan Western Europeans, not really. Maybe except the United Kingdom. Um, and so this is how democratic consensus does let you do the same thing. And with infrastructure, it's the same thing. Um, because public transportation is not something the local magnets use. The local magnets drive. The local magnets are the top one, two, three, four, at most five percent. Um, so if you have a country where you have 50 cars per 1,000 people, the local magnets drive because the local magnets, uh, um, because the local magnets uh, are again they're the top few percent, and uh, if there's and usually it's like maybe one car for the family at most two. Um, um, it d depends on how patriarchal the society is, for example. Uh, and so if you have a society, let's say the Philippines, just picking a random example here, is 120. Um, and this means that um, the local magnets drive, much of the Manila middle class drives. Uh, so if you have a system where you don't have very strong democratic institutions like ideological, like national ideological political parties uh, that um, can either thrive without uh, much elite buy-in, which um, socialism, like social democracy did until, let's say, the new left, um, or uh, in, in post-new left social uh, democratic parties and green parties have been able to govern, uh, yeah, with some middle class buy-ins, but with middle class that, that's selected for being okay not driving, for, for being okay with not driving or without markers of conspicuous consumption. Uh, much of the New left is explicitly anti-consumer, so in the realm of transportation, it means uh, being okay, uh, uh, being okay, not having a mansion, but living in an apartment in the, in city center. Now we really call it gentrification, but that's not that's not how the people doing it were thinking in the nineteen seventies, eighties, nineties. Biking, maybe taking the the train. I mean, like I like my status does not require me to like buy and expensive car to show off to everyone that they can afford it, thank you very much. Um, and now, do these people exist in the Philippines? I'm sure they do, but there's no, but the way that anocracy works in a place like that, or, or again, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, Pakistan, um, there's no way for a government to actually cobble a coalition of the non-driving majority and maybe um, some allies among the few can drive and actually improve public transportation. Um, now, um, so, so this is, so yeah, if you compare the Philippines, which are, which is a democratic country with free elections, and you compare China, yeah, China has better public transportation, China has better infrastructure, but don't compare China with the Philippines, compare China with South Korea, compare China with Japan. Um, so again, China is doing well, but China is not doing atypically well from what I would expect just from the combo of size, because it, its high-speed rail network really is so much bigger than anything else. Um, it's like three-quarters of global high-speed rail ridership is in China. Um, it's only like two-thirds or three-quarters of global high-speed rail ridership is in China. But again, that's a size argument. And then if you look at the subway systems, yeah, Shanghai has a giant system, a system that's grown very rapidly because of the fast economic growth. Um, or Beijing, same thing. Um, where is Beijing? Here is Beijing. Yeah. Um, so um, this is the system in Beijing. It's grown. This is the, this was the system in 2020. Uh, the, the, um, line one, line two. And that's what I'm trying to get 2000. Sorry. In, there was a system in 2000. And then line 13 and um, the Baton line, 
which extends line one essentially, and then um, I want to say line five, line four, and I don't remember the others anymore. Line ten, maybe, maybe Airport Express. Um, another extension, and then more and more lines. Um, so very large system, uh, very large urban rail system, uh, high uh, ridership consequently. Um, in Shanghai, same thing. The difference is Beijing is kind of atypical and it tries to pretend that it is a grid. Um, like, <coughs> I mean, it is a grid. The city, the city's street network is a grid, but they're trying to do the thing where they're pretending that it's not one city center. Um, so they're trying to build a bunch of centers on the grid, whereas Shanghai is much more honest that it is a city with a center, which is around here. Um, and, uh, yeah, and the same thing. Uh, this is only open in the 90s. Um, and then line one, line two, line three, line four, line one is extended to line five, and then a lot of new lines. Um, but the scale is not atypical of um, of peers, and because Shanghai is so big, its peers in the first world are Seoul and Tokyo. Um, it has some differences. Um, I, I've gone over the traditions of rapid transit construction by country. Uh, so that would be, so I, I did something like a, the American way of building uh, rapid transit, this blog post. Um, and I've done one for the Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc, uh, which influenced China and was influenced by Britain. I've done Britain, I've done France, and I've done Germany, and I keep procrastinating years at a time. I started in 2018 doing uh, Japanese and Chinese. Um, so yeah, there are some traditions we're saying, like for example in Shanghai, I'm highlighting that this is a very radial system. Beijing is not what the other Chinese cities um, are rather like Shanghai. Um, this is a Soviet thing. Um, in chat, people mentioned the Soviet Triangle. Um, the Soviet Triangle is just my, exp uh, my expression for how uh, uh, Soviet bloc cities uh, build radial systems. Uh, and they try to make sure that the three lines, as far as possible, don't intersect in one point, but it's, it's three points, so that, uh, it, they, so that they can distribute things better. So, Moskva three lines. I think there's one point that's all three and then this is one and three, so that's unintended, but the others were pure triangles. And then they add a circle and then more lines that are just more radials. Um, maybe they start building them out and then they uh, throw on them, but it's kind of an idealized system in which maybe you have a circle or even multiple circles these days. Um, but um, then they're crossed by diameters, the diameter goes through the circle, each pair of diameters intersects once with a transfer. Ideally all intersections should be simple, but um, in practice you have three ways, maybe even four ways. Um, and uh, just to point out something out, uh, I believe the median kilometer in the Moskva metro was built shortly after communism and if I'm wrong, then it, I'm, then, it, oh, then it was built a few years before. The growth of the system was not purely communist, so the planning continued through the Yeltsin years. Um, like rather anocratic, so Russia did not have uh, so, so Russia did not have ideological political parties again. Like yeah, there was a communist party, um, but it's not like there was Yeltsin versus the communists, kind of big left versus right. Uh, ideological conflict um, and everything ended up getting co-opted into the Putinist regime anyway. Um, so that was, a, a, and, the, and it was such comic corruption and nepotism that, yeah, that's an, another kind of, it's a different kind of anocracy from uh, early 20th century Japan and this also uh, collapsed in the authoritarian direction under Putin and again they've kept building. Um, the construction there is rather professional, the, it's very depoliticized, the uh, rail industry in Russia in general. Um, Taiwan and Korea, yes, it, Korea, Taiwan and Korea have um, a lot of identity politics with their left versus right, but there's 
uh, there's recognizable ideology there. Um, things like um, the current conservatives keep hitting the liberals for being too pro-gay or something like that, or, 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 or too feminist. Um, this is not what happens in non-ideological politics. In non-ideological politics, each party hits the other on the exact same thing. Like, each party hits the other on being too elitist or too detached from the working class. If you don't have class politics in which it's very clear which party represents the working class, and you can say, no, we don't represent the working class, we represent farmers, or we represent the middle class. We also exist. Deal. Um, and, and yeah, in Taiwan it's more ideal than that, but even in Taiwan, I mean, it's a lot of it is about um, there it is about foreign policy in relationship with China. That is not that is not an ideal question anymore. That um, it is ideal in Israel to have the primary left right divide be about um, the peace process with the Palestinians, in particular the Palestinian Authority, or even uh, how in periods in the United Kingdom. Um, Imperialism was a big divide between the Gladstone, between the Gladstone era, um, era liberals and the conservatives. Back then, Little Englander was not an epithet used against conservatives who uh, didn't want to be part of the EU bloc. It was an epithet used by conservatives against the liberals who didn't want to build an empire. Um, and I think the liberals even owned that expression. It wasn't purely a slur. Um, and yeah, it's about. Uh, uh, and yeah, yes, exactly. So the democracies have, so every regime has to have buy-in. It's not, it's never one leader against the entire country that one leader is going to get cooed if everyone dislikes them. Um, so, um, yeah, so what they do is they buy the middle class through consumerism. Uh, and what is this consumerism? It's, you get a car. You don't have to deal with buses. The state's priorities are going to be di directed toward your middle class consumption rather than um, to, let's say, building a public transportation system for everyone. A lot of it is very, it's, and it, it's explicitly about segregation because cars are just easier to segregate with cars than with trains, and this is also why in South Africa the situation is the way it is, the, the trains are just not very good um, because they would have had to be built. Um, in places like uh, Johannesburg slash uh, Pretoria, they would have had to be built to serve both white and black people if it was optimal. And that was unacceptable to the apartheid regime, so they didn't do it. And much of that has persisted, like the, the lines, uh, even the white desire for self-segregation away from black people. Um, Kind of atypical because in first world countries, if you have racism, then the demographic majority is economically dominant and also politically dominant. In South Africa, the demographic majority today, the say black people, is politically dominant but is not economically dominant. Um, whites are turned blacks by, a, by an enormous amount. I think it's a factor of like three or four. Um, and uh, like the, the top management of uh, corporations and so on, that's also white people. Uh, which, for example, in, uh, in the UAE, uh, yeah, the, uh, I mean, the, the uh, minority of citizens, of minority citizens, are economically and politically dominant, but they don't dominate the market, they are rentiers. Um, so, um, about, uh, okay, so, the branching issue is just purely a uh, tradition that's got generalized. Um, some of these traditions are pretty random things, and yeah, you can maybe trace them to an ideology. The example is that um, another example is with housing. So, uh, in most countries, if you check how much housing they built, they uh, quote the numbers in housing units. So, in the United States, they say they built this many housing units. In Japan, in Germany, in Thailand, in Turkey. In Israel, in former communist countries, um, they don't say that. They say how much total floor area they built. So in China, for example, uh, I have barely been able to find housing unit numbers for construction, but I have been able to find uh, total square meters 
total residential square meters built per year, things like that, that I haven't been able to find. Uh, Russia, same thing, and even Ukraine. Um, because, the, so that thing can maybe um, attribute to the Leninist idea that, um, okay, it's, there's socialism, everyone is equal except for the uh, people who have been shot. And uh, so you take the total floor area, the total built up floor area in, let's say, a city, divide by the population. This is the quota. Every person gets that amount, or every household gets that amount per uh, person, more or less. Um, yes, it means that some households will have to share, and that's fine. The local party functionaries will deal with it, and of course, because that system is never as efficient as people think it is, that involves a lot of bribery and local cajoling to make sure that you are not put in the same apartment with people who um, hate you. Um, and of course, if you're maybe suspicious to the regime, then that will happen. This is not even a communist invention. This is... I don't know if they, if they did that on purpose, but... Uh, um, the... Uh, but it, if, it, if they didn't converge with the same thing, the, like this. Uh, this is... This and similar things is why the United States has the Third Amendment to the Constitution. Um, and so that is, a, but this is something that kind of makes sense because it, there's a difference between a place that builds, you know, a thousand tiny units and a place that builds a thousand big units because the big units have space for more people. They will maybe house um, families that can then uh, vacate other big units that will then be used maybe by housemates, whereas if it's small units, you're, you're not providing housing for 4,000 people, you're providing, you're providing housing for 1,000 people. So it's something that kind of makes sense in a way. I mean, I don't think it makes sense without mentioning dwelling units, because it matters whether you're forcing people to, to do house check. But it kind of makes sense, so it has been retained by countries that transitioned out of communism, like China or Ukraine or Russia. Um, and, um, so, yeah, um, Puerto, yeah, Puerto Rico politics is statehood versus status quo, but Puerto Rico is also a colony. Puerto Rico does not self-govern because the sovereign state in Puerto Rico is not Puerto Rico, it is the United States, and yes, they have tax benefits, that does not make them not a colony. Um, and um, the, the, like, any more than um, uh, migrant workers in Dubai who don't have to pay taxes because uh, Dubai, because the UAE doesn't have income taxes, the fact that they don't have to pay income taxes does not make them not, you know, repressed migrants. And it's the same thing with PR. So yeah, in PR, uh, the um, status quo in order to preserve, in, in order to uh, preserve the illusion of some independent standard that enters that there will ever be independence versus just move on, take statehood, that is a thing. Um, but again, Puerto Rico does not suffer. Um, so for example, Puerto Rico is kind of disgustingly auto-oriented. Uh, but first of all, Puerto Rico is not poor. I mean, it's poor by American standards today. I don't think it's poor by the standards of the America of, let's say, the 19th. 60s or 70s, by which point the country was already extremely auto-oriented. Um, and of course, it's learning from the United States. So yeah, of course, it would have an American transportation policy. Um, and, and the point is that when you have... Um, so, so, so PR is kind of special, but the point is that um, when you have a very stable system, yeah, you can say, we're going to build collective infrastructure. So that would be... Uh, and, and, and I kind of want to emphasize infrastructure, like public transportation, above, um, not above everything else because it's also related to industrialization, um, but I'm going to kind of take away health and education from this equation because um, you can do improvements in health and education through state-led programs, so that it's something that you could do if you're post-war South Korea, which had very high health and education outcomes for how poor it was. Um, or you can do it um, or Sweden, Finland, same thing. Um, for the twentieth century. Um, or 
cube or uh, like communist investments in, in these. Uh, but it can also be done by NGOs. Health and education, and I have a video on this, health and education work at, the, at a much different, at a very different scale from transportation infrastructure, which is something that could be done at NGO scale. And the example that I keep going back to, not example, two examples I keep going back to, uh, are that um, in the Rohingya refugee camps uh, in, in Cox's Bazar, the infant mortality rate is uh, um, not as of today, as of when I saw the number. So, to pull uh, Rohingya refugee camp, uh, not IMR, infant mortality. Yeah, this uh, paper uh, has the uh, uh, infant mortality rate for Hindu refugees in Bangladesh as of uh, 2018. It was, I want to say, maybe a little bit worse than Bangladesh, maybe, or maybe, uh, it, it's. Bit, I mean, they had a pretty similar, the pretty similar health outcomes to. Bangladesh, and I think maybe even better than or something like that, or maybe even better than the Burmese average, which is kind of insane for, for a group that's been uh, casually massacred in ethnic clans, and that in Bangladesh they have basically no rights. Um, that is something that NGOs are very experienced at doing. So things like uh, uh, basic healthcare, basic literacy, this is something that can be done even in weak states. And of course, where do you have NGO penetration? in weak states. Um, India does not need a ton of NGOs. Bangladesh doesn't at this point either, but Bangladesh was so horrifically poor um, at independence that it kind of became an NGO state. So good health and education for our poor is. Um, also, uh, it never had the Indian license Raj, so uh, it has uh, labor-intensive growth. But its infrastructure is abominable. Like the, the, remember, Bangladesh is almost as rich as India. Dhaka should have a metro system that looks like Mumbai or Delhi. It doesn't. Um, and the construction costs are especially bad because one of the problems when you um, uh, aren't capable of building your own public transportation infrastructure is you outsource the state to other actors. Actors are not aware of your local circumstances very well, so probably you're outsourcing to richer countries, like uh, maybe first world countries, but uh, Western countries are kind of not doing that anymore these days. Uh, so it could be Japan, it could be China, um, countries with, let's say, much more reliable electricity, so they will build a light rail system in Addis Ababa, China will do that, that uh, taps into the electric grid rather than uh, having its own power plant, which is what early 20th century America did when it was building streetcars. In fact, the uh, power plant and the streetcar company were often one because it would use the same infrastructure to uh, distribute uh, electricity. Um, and, th and they needed to do that because th there was no reliable power grid in early 20th century America. Yet. Um, now, China kind of leapfrogs that because it has electricity, people have electricity in China, so um, rail networks just plug, plug into that. Addis Ababa does not have that, so when China imitated that, um, when, when it built the Addis Ababa light rail system, what happened was, when, what happens is whenever there's a power outage, the trains don't run. Um, and um, so, so this is an example of what happens when you have a weak state, you don't have the in-house expertise to actually do the required modifications to have a successful, in this case, public transportation system. It's a transportation system in general. They have um, a lot of uh, problems with being unable to repair Chinese-built infrastructure because they don't speak Chinese and the manuals are entirely in Chinese and so on in, in a bunch of African countries. Um, but with public transportation, there are a lot of moving parts. So it's much more prone to this than, for example, cars. You don't need expensive technology to maintain a highway. Um, I mean, you, yeah, you need one to build a car, but the cars are imported. And um, so, the, uh, so, so the result of all this is that 
the, the, the countries that have a mixed regime type, again, Iran is an exception, um, because, there are, because the governments are weak, uh, end up having worse infrastructure, especially public transportation infrastructure, because they can't, uh, they, they, they can't credibly commit to anything that restrains consumption. Often they don't even want to. Um, on the contrary, they get middle class buy-in through encouraging this consumption, which, bear in mind, it's something that autocracies, that capitalist autocracies do too. Singapore does that. Uh, China does that. Uh, it gets middle class buy-in through growth, which can then be spent. Um, but that is, I guess it's maybe downstream of growth in the sense that first of all, that what happened in China in the 80s and 90s and times, first of all, total restraint in consumption, and then buy-in was through, I mean, there was still party, uh, like, tra tra party control, but also visible growth, like more good urban jobs. Um, maybe jobs are not considered good by the standards of a European or American or Japanese industrial worker, but are by the standards of a contemporary Chinese peasant. Um, and uh, so growth through just more labor intensivity and then over time, uh, so, so it's people who get to work in these factories and then save that money after a few years of the um, kind of infamous uh, uh, corporate control of, uh, of the line workers and then they come back and maybe they come back to the village much wealthier than before, so they're okay with that trade-off. It's um, not just China, again, Bangladesh is the same thing. Um, or they stay in um, uh, climb up the value chain, so the so there is like a, a there's always something to offer people to that um, it's visibly better, and then at some point you need to start allowing middle class consumption. Um, when you have a large enough middle class, that you can't just ignore them, but uh, so in Singapore, that consumption is abroad. So within Singapore, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're not what, as a European, consider middle class, you can't afford a car. Uh, and even if you can, um, I mean, you still have to pay a lot for it. Uh, but you can fly to Thailand, you can fly to Malaysia, fly to Indonesia. So you have the, so so. It's one of the things that um, Singapore. I think Singapore specifically, like much more so than a bunch of European countries where people often complain about that, um, the emissions numbers for Singapore, the greenhouse gas emissions per capita in Singapore, they're in theory low, but I think it's kind of a fake number. Um, so Singapore, what is the Singapore CO2 emissions? Um, yeah, so it's not a high number um, for how wealthy it is, but this is without international flying, and Singaporeans do a lot of international flying just as a matter of private consumption. It's pretty normalized there. Um, so a lot, so maybe in Singapore and even in the Chinese middle class, a lot of the consumption happens abroad. Uh, Hong Kong uh, also a lot of consumption happens abroad. Um, or you can just do consumption that's not cars. That's also something that's viable if you have a good enough urban. Uh, Good, good enough urbanism. I mean, Singapore, yeah, I mean, in, in Singapore, you absolutely can spend a lot of money on food. Singapore has these really excellent street food stalls at the food court, the welfare centers, where you're eating very well for six, eight dollars at this point. Um, but you can absolutely go sit down, uh, maybe go, go to a sit down restaurant, it's not even that fancy. and going to cost you 20, 30, um, more the more, uh, the, 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 the more middle class, the higher end of the clientele, um, especially if there are a lot of experts, everything very more expensive, you absolutely can do that. Um, so it, 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 is, it does require transition to a, different kind, to a different kind of model when you're um, rich the way Singapore is. Um, but by then, I mean, Singapore already has a, a large uh, subway network, a large, the, the MRT network. So yeah, I mean, if they uh, uh, have to call back some of the car restraint, they will have a lower model split. But their model split in Singapore, and I think as of just before Corona, was something like 58% for, trip, for, for work trips. I mean, yeah, if the 58% become 50%, it's going to be annoying, but it's not going to turn Singapore into Houston. Seoul, by the way, is 50%. Um, and I don't mean Seoul, say Seoul, plus Enchan, plus the entirety of Gyeonggi is of the mid-2010s 
50% uh, of people get to work on public transportation. Um, and again, it's a rich country that blitzed through the democratic transition. Um, and then you have a much poorer country like Banco, like Banco poorer country, like Thailand or Malaysia, where you don't have anything near these numbers. Um, because again, people drive. Um, so that's kind of the regime type thing. It's really a U curve where now, of course, by the way, it's not really a choice. I mean, you can be democratic like the United States and choose to be auto-oriented, but you can make that choice. Separately, I would say the United States is a weaker state in a lot of ways and had to uh, rely on the veto power of the magnates in the 1910s and 20s um, with all these lockbox bills, like the video that I made previously about the history of car culture in the United States. Um, so, I mean, technically because the United States is such a large share of the democratic first world that brings down the democratic average if you're population weighting it, but at level of policy, maybe you should not population weight things. And then, I mean, like the, the average first world democracy in this case is something like France or Sweden or Norway or Portugal or, um, I mean, not Switzerland because it's atypically transit oriented or South Korea or Japan, but I mean, France again, Belgium. Maybe Belgium is atypically oriented for not America. Um, so, so these kind of in-betweeners, to clarify my saying in-betweeners, I mean, again, things like France, maybe Germany, that are not Switzerland, Austria, the, the Netherlands, if you're counting bikes, Japan, South Korea, but are also not the United States. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's pretty, I mean, the model split in uh, Paris, for example, murders Theme murders every Southeast Asian city that's not Singapore. Um, in Bangkok, the, the model split for all of public transit is 30 something, but most of that is buses and people ride them out of poverty and the numbers go down every year. The rail model split in Bangkok, as of when I last looked, which was, or when I last looked at which was like five years ago and it has gone up since, is 6%. Um, Paris, the entirety of uh, public transportation in Indian France is 43. And it's stable, maybe even, maybe even was inching up before. Uh, so yeah, that's a uh, um, th that is a thing that you can do in what's probably the median democracy, the, the median first world democracy. On this question, um, because I mean, I guess Paris also is, is very large, but um, the uh, but for example, Spain has higher model split than France, um, or rather, Spain in twenty twenty one had the same model split as pre corona. France, Britain, Germany, uh, 16%, 15, 16%. Um, so, uh, again, it can go up, it can go down from there. And, um, so anyway, that, that's a kind of, let's call it U-curve, but again, it's not entirely correct to call it a U-curve. Um, now, I said I want to talk about the myth of authoritarian efficiency and the ordinariness of China. So. The myth of authoritarian efficiency is not about China, because at the time the myth came into being, it was probably fascist Italy and Nazi Germany at the time, the mentality toward China was that it was really poor and was held back by Confucian ideology or something, the idea that Confucianism increases rather than decreases growth goes back to maybe the 1990s, maybe even not that, maybe even just the 2000s. Previously, the belief was that Confucianism uh, slowed a, a, a country down. Um, same thing with uh, Hinduism. The belief was that Hinduism was slowing India down, and then it turned out it was just a license raj. Um, and, um, no, seriously, people said that the Hindu rate of growth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in 1990, uh, so on the, not, not 1990, but in, um, in the 1980s, uh, on the 90s as well, uh, as the license Raj was on its way out, uh, so, as I said, so after you know, 40 ish years of the license Raj, India's GDP per capita, as a, it, it, I mean, it had increased in, the, in these 40 years, but India's GDP per capita, 
relative to that of the United Kingdom was lower than at independence. Um, that's been completely different in the, in the last 35 years, but that was the first 40 years of India. Um, yeah, exactly. So the fascists um, liked to say that they ran the trains on time. Um, there are serious historians who have studied this myth. My understanding is that this myth was made by people who are kind of not exactly fascist. Uh, so, so, so first of all, it's a myth that my understanding is not something that Mussolini and Hitler him, themselves pushed very hard. They did, but they, they pushed other things, um, like national greatness more. Uh, the, at least they made their trains around time, was, as I understand it, a, a, an American slash British myth by people who were trying to create excuses. Um, both for that and both to say, well, we're not inefficient, it's just, uh, well, we can't be like Mussolini, is kind of the cope. And now, of course, they didn't make the trains run on time. To the contrary, both countries sabotaged their railway networks because uh, they, uh, at the time, were, I mean, Germany was in the industrial frontier. It was not as wealthy as the US or UK because it had a larger traditional uh, rural sector, but it was pretty, but it was wealthy. Italy was less wealthy, but it was still um, uh, fairly industrialized, so um, they, at the time, they did, so for middle class buy-in, they sold uh, their system as uh, giving the middle class all of room for consumption, for, for consumerism, and that again, not cars, so things like uh, uh, Kraft, Dietz, Freud, uh, the idea that um, they would build the autobahns, in fact, they made the lx build the competition, because they were the only big enough company that could uh, build infrastructure at that scale. Uh, they told Germans to save, uh, to, to uh, open savings account, and at the end of a certain period of time they would get the Volkswagen. Um, so again, this is buy-in because the German people rather liked Hitler until uh, they were losing the war. Um, so uh, a system like that could get a lot of buy-in. Um, and of course, none of that happened because Germany uh, got into the war and then lost the war. Uh, but um, the but but there was this idea of consumerism again, deferred consumerism, but still consumerism. Uh, but um, the, now, separately, there were some interesting things that they were doing with trains because the the Reichsbahn was not a Nazi institution; it was a conservative one. But um, the but, but on that note, they didn't run the trains on time, so there was this myth that they were very efficient. Um, now, the thing that, is, that has probably been most closely studied is the, the military. Of course, Italy was kind of comically inefficient, but Nazi Germany, same thing. Like, Nazi Germany was worse at logistics than the United States. Nazi Germany was worse at delegating command, delegating authority than the United States. Um, in the United States, there was the system where there is always someone in command. If, uh, let's say, George Marshall, if General George Marshall is, uh, uh, or General of the Army George Marshall, I think, if I saw wrong, uh, is asleep, then there is a system for a knight commander who's going to be in, uh, who's going to be in command while uh, Marshall is asleep. Marshall always went home to sleep at night. He had long days, I think the, uh, his day ended at maybe nine at night or something like that, but he did not do all-nighters because there was a system for, for there was a, a, an organized system of what happens when the leader is uh, incapacitated due to needing to sleep or due to uh, having surgery or something like that. Um, and of course the United States Civilian government takes it to kind of comical levels with the presidential chain of succession rather than president, vice president. Beyond that, if you need to go that way, Congress is going to need to elect someone anyway. Um, and yeah, and the Nazis did not have that. Um, during uh, the invasion of Normandy, uh, the, not the invasion by the Nazis, sorry, during, during overlord, during the liberation of Normandy. Um, there were divisions that were immediate to Hitler, so only Hitler had the authority to move them. 
if he was sleeping during the afternoon, which he went, there's the, the, it, it's the thing that the Northern Europeans mock Southern Europeans for when it's called siesta, but here it's called Schlafstunde, um, and it's the same thing. When Hitler had his Schlafstunde, uh, nobody was going to wake him up and tell him, um, Heil mein Führer, we need to move these divisions right now because uh, the Allies are breaking through. Um, so they were not efficient in what they cared about the most, which was the military. Like the, the goal of both fascist Italy and Nazi Germany was uh, military prowess. This is how they defined themselves, and they. And I'm not just saying they failed at the level at, at the point that they failed strategically because they fought too many countries at once. Like they just did not fight as effectively. Um, and again, with infrastructure. Oh, I thought it was a schlaf. What I heard what it was it was a schlafstunde. Um, um, I read it in a tertiary source, so um, it. It is possible that it is uh, that it uh, was changed. In, um, through. There are things I read in enough different independent sources that I'm securing out. Um, like mostly the successive sabotage of infrastructure during Overlord, the French Resistance. The French Resistance heyday was um, when they were uh, causing so much sabotage during Overlord that they uh, that the railway network in France was operating at one third its pre June nineteen forty four capacity, so that the so that German divisions had serious trouble getting to the front. Um, the Bundeswehr public functioning is completely fine. The military here is the mean, but as I said, Imperial Germany, but also the Third Reich, these were both highly militarized states for which. Uh, special attention was paid to military prowess. Um, there are states that care a lot about the military and suck at it. Um, I won't say every Arab state, but maybe it's only most Arab states are like that. Um, they, they have uh, pretty large levels of military spending uh, relative to GDP, and the military is just don't want. Um, like maybe the, a few elite things, like if Jordan does airdrops um, in the Gaza Strip, but a country of Jordan's size, which is not... Jordan, Jordan's small, but it's not tiny. It's middle income. It has military spending, I think, 7% of GDP. Its military should be more of a player in it. Um, Egypt gave up and just went to like a much smaller military and so on. Um, these are countries that chose... These are countries that care about the military and suck at it. Germany chooses not to be militarized. Germany chooses to have a main army um, because military in the, 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 militarization is uncomfortable to Germans. That is something very different. Um, this is Germany making a certain choice. Um, and but, but anyway, with infrastructure, um, often it's the kind of same thing that the states, that often the states either are pretty good in military shit, or could be, or with one enormous exception, and that exception is the United States are also good at um, infrastructure, because it's the same kind of thing that requires a lot of top-down centralization, and yeah, you can have a lot of regional empowerment, like in the Nordic countries, and you can have uh, a lot of subcontracting, but at the end of the day, decisions are going to be made by a, um, by a permanent civil service, which needs to be built in a way that is not a deep state. You cannot have a military like Pakistan's and succeed. You cannot have infrastructure bureaucracy that thinks it is the um, that it thinks it is ISI. But you also need it to be not politicized. So it needs to not be politicized. But it also needs not to politicize the state in, in two different directions. Two different directions here. Really. It's important. And, and again, I think democracies do that better than autocracies. I mean, you can look at the merged costs file here. Um, the low cost countries um, are all democratic, with one exception, which is Turkey. And in Turkey, yeah, Turkey is a, another kind of weird democracy. In Iran, it's because they want to be, which is very weird. In Turkey, it's because um, of a certain form of political polarization, uh, which you would expect would impact infrastructure but doesn't. Um, 
or it does, but not in a way that makes it unviable. And the reason is that um, opposition-held cities uh, can borrow money from the from European institutions because European institutions uh, wish Erdogan kindly fucked off and died. It's like how um, every ally of Israel uh, wishes that Netanyahu fucked off and died. Um, except that, I mean, it's not like, a, it's not like there's any uh, Israeli opposition that could get such money because Israel is extremely unitary, so it doesn't matter. It, like, it's not like Ron Hultai can get money from international institutions that are going in, to invest in Tel Aviv because they hate Netanyahu. Whereas Turkey is not that unitary because maybe it's bigger, maybe it's Istanbul is a vast city. Um, but it's not just Istanbul. Ankara and Izmir, and Izmir also have access to uh, lower cost borrowing than the, than, the French, than the Turkish state because again, the people with the money hate Erdogan. I mean, I don't really want to say it's irrational hate of Erdogan, but they don't trust Erdogan and they don't trust the animal. Um, and um, the or, or the average, and so with that exception, all the low-cost countries are democratic. Um, again, maybe Bulgaria is another example of something that's kind of democratic. I'm not familiar enough to tell you, but all of Southern Europe is democratic. Yes, Greece is annoyingly clientelist. Um, they shield the engineers away from the clientelism in, in Greece because um, engineering prestige. Uh, and fundamentally, Greece is a democracy. Again, it's not a democracy that functions very well, but it's a democracy, it's not a democracy. Um, they even have the ideological politics, even with the clientele. Um, it's ideological politics that often is not workers versus bosses, because um, Greece, even more so than the rest of Southern Europe, has economic dwarfism, so um, not enough of the workers versus bosses system, because there just aren't enough workers at big businesses for that, but um, questions about religion and state, yeah. Um, Turkey is not an, I mean, I would not call Turkey a client state of the EU. Um, the plant bit is that the EU is bribing Erdogan to uh, let it outsource repression of uh, refugee migration to him on other things. Um, like I think what Erdogan has been doing with uh, uh, being an asshole with taking forever to let Sweden into NATO creates more problems for the United States in Europe than Israel's refusal to send weapons to Europe. Um, and again, the Middle East, is, like in, and honestly in the Middle East, both of them are just freelancing. I would say that Turkey is freelancing in a way that is more fuck you to America than Israel, but both of them, yeah, long. Um, th again, there's a reason why the elites, the, like the political elites in the US and the EU are dying to have both of those assholes just fuck off. But, um, but the point is that with not military um, stuff, but with infrastructure, um, the, um, yeah, but it's not in the UK. Um, but, um, is that the best places, again, they tend to be democratic, and again, of course, the democratic average might be pulled up because of the United States, but um, you can repeat all of America's failures without democracy, for example, in Singapore and in Hong Kong, um, or what is being done in, um, what's it called, or what is being done in um, a bunch of Gulf states that have, none of the Gulf states has low costs. Um, some of them have medium costs, um, like Saudi Arabia, I think, or maybe the, the one line in Dubai was not that expensive. Um, but then there's Doha, which is just a horror story, um, because maybe they're buying prestige, so they don't care very much. Um, now again, this is these are states that are buying prestige, so it doesn't matter, and then the kind of more ordinary case, um, I don't remember, I don't remember either. Um, I know that Doha doesn't. Um, Doha does a lot of overbuilding. Um, because again, it doesn't matter. It's just about the, the payment is almost like bribery to foreign companies, not to call them a disgusting apartheid state. Um, 
so again, these are um, uh, so again, these, but these are atypically atypical dictatorships. The, certainly, the level of population because of China, but also I think at the level of policy, just because they just happen to get into money. Um, sure, but it's, I mean, yes, and um, the um, Pakistan has Chinese has the Chinese built orange line in uh, in Lahore. Uh, much more extensive than anything in China. Uh, Hanoi outsourced metro construction to China, same thing. Uh, what you mean, city to Japan, results were rather bad as well. Uh, Dhaka to Japan, results are rather, also rather bad. Um, it is this kind of outsourcing of the state government from the fact that the state has, under, um, has underdeveloped over sort of civil service. Um, and again, I'm relating to an democracy because like maybe if you have such strong local magnets and you can't have civil service, which is apolitical and chosen by merit, because you have to get buy-in by letting the uh, second sons of the gentry um, be part of it, even if they are lazy fail sons. Uh, so having a so having a merit-based civil service system is a part of state capacity that is not available everywhere. Um, and this is something, by the way, is available to the United States, and the United States does it. it. Just has chosen to take this professional system and then impose an overclass of political appointees on top of it. Um, and this is, I think, related to again to these myths of authoritarian efficiency. So part of this is just people coping by saying that, well, maybe there, maybe fascism was also bad. Yes, it was, but it's kind of cringe socialist to say that or something. Uh, South Korea was a hybrid regime between, I think, 87 and 97. Um, while it was still shooting at protesters and um, torturing people with opinions in the early 80s, I would not have called it, I would not call it hybrid. Um, it was just, it was autocratic. Um, but anyway, um, the, but, but also South Korean civil, civil service predates that. Um, so, you can actually maintain civil service through transition. Um, it actually takes a lot of effort to fuck up the civil service. Um, not saying it's impossible, but it but ten years of transition will not be enough. Um, and yeah, so um, the uh, so, so this is why you're getting better things in either stable democracies or stable autocracies. And again, people have this belief that autocracies do it better because they are more exposed maybe to the failings of a system where you have, where you have free media that talks about this um, than in, in cases where it's all uh, kept under wraps. And uh, then there's also the cope element where uh, the inefficiencies in the United States have since been recast as like sources of strength. Um, remember, Jane Jacobs talks about the inefficiency of small business is a good thing for cities where if you were too efficient, then the city is dead. Um, so a lot of it is just cope, to be honest. Uh, is it uh, Singapore? I mean, Singapore is, 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 is exceptional in many ways, but no, seriously, Singapore. Um, the, and yeah, in Singapore, the Lee clan is unneeded. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons that maybe some uh, autocrats will not want to invest in this kind of civil service because they would rather end up like the Kim dynasty where it's still in power than like Park who was assassinated. Um, but, I mean, it's not like uh, all of these leaders who are not Park but also are not stable like the camps are safe. Um, and um, kind of, I mean, South Korea builds at very low costs. It builds infrastructure at very low costs. Taiwan doesn't, but remember that uh, Taiwan, because it's a smaller country and its capital is a smaller city than respectively South Korea and Seoul, uh, it built later, so Seoul started building as a stable autocracy, I think is what matters, whereas in um, Taiwan, the plans were made during that decade of transition, 
and during the decade of transition, um, the KMT, so the KMT was a party state. It's something that's usually a communist thing or an ex-communist thing like China, but um, the KMT was a party state, uh, which is not how, let's say, military dictatorships work. So because it was a party state, it was at the time great party money and state money, as the, and, as, and as they needed to divide these two things, as they, as they were still in power in the late 80s, um, early and mid nineties, but could foresee their own uh, dis uh, their, their own defeat at the polls. Um, they started separating them in a way that was more favorable to the party and its apparatchiks, and a lot of that money ended up parked in infrastructure. So there was a lot of corruption in the early construction of the Taipei MRT, and that kind of um, and separately also the nineties were much more neoliberal are the 1970s when it comes to state privatization. So there was much more privatization of state planning in the, with the Taipei MRT, just because they, the, that was in vogue at the time. Uh, in, in the same way that Denmark used to have the highest subway construction costs in the Nordic countries because they built late, they started later. So they started with a more privatized system and it took a while for Sweden, Norway and Finland to catch up to that level of privatization in 20 tons. Um, so yeah, Taiwan has less light capacity in this, but it's not, but, uh, um, but partly it's not, but it, again, it has the same democratization timing in South Korea. It's just that it, first of all, built infrastructure during that transition period and also it built infrastructure in an era when the global mentality was one in which you need to outsource the state to consultants because the state is bad and inefficient. Um, the, I mean, the, the discourse around state capacity is something that is much more recent than the 1990s. Um, like at the level where it matters to policy at least. Um, it's something that's, honestly when it comes to policy, only really emerged during Corona. Um, like there, there, were, there were things that happened before Corona but it's mostly something that only made it to the mainstream during Corona. Um, and yeah, so you have this kind of myth of, auto of autocratic efficiency. In practice, it's maybe a little bit worse, or maybe about the same. I mean, as I said, I want to talk about the ordinariness of China, where the high-speed rail network, um, yeah, it has special features, like it's much faster than Japan or Europe, but okay, it's a bigger country. Um, the cities are more so. So it's a very dense country. China. I mean, I mean this part of China, not this part of China. Um, so maybe the cities are kind of close together, but no. But on the other hand, you also have big cities that are far apart, like Beijing to Shanghai. So maybe you invest more in higher speed. And there's um, and China has the East Asian form of urbanization, in which are few large cities. I mean, not few because China is big, but compared with population, whereas Europe is many medium-sized cities, so it's easier to just run super fast through open land between Beijing and Shanghai. Um, but I mean, their construction costs are not low. I mean, they're, if you don't PPP adjust, they look low, but if you do, they're, if anything, a little bit higher than Europe because they, uh, again, it's some random tradition, it's not regime-type related thing, it's just they build um, elevated and not at great lines um, when they're not in tunnel. And um, the scope of the system, the, 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 its large extent, again, it's just because this is a country and this is not a country. This is a country. This is a country. This is a country. This is not a country. Um, and because it's something that only happens through state action, uh, not through private action, yeah, I mean, you can maybe, you can build high-speed rail and then let private companies compete above the rails, but the infrastructure decisions are always made by the state. Only the planning, only the active planning state can do it, and the EU does not have that. The EU is a regulatory state. The EU does not have any planning instruments available to it. Um, there, are, there could be ad hoc groupings of countries that uh, join things together, like Airbus is a multinational uh, effort, which is uh, partly a state, it's a state of corporation in part, like the French state, the Spanish state, the German state, the United States, also, these three states have stakes, have, have significant stakes in it, 
but it's not an EU effort, for example. Um, and this really does slow infrastructure development across borders. Um, and everything else that people talk about with China, I mean, for example, China has environmental reviews. Um, it does not have the infinite lawsuit process that the United States does, uh, but neither does most of Europe. Um, in Germany, when an infrastructure project is announced, you have two months to register that you're going to object. Now, you don't need to give the reasoning, so you can say in the two month period, I am going to sue and then spend a year looking for pretexts, but you still have less ability to um, sue the state than in the United States. To the extent Germany underbuilds high-speed rail infrastructure or metro infrastructure, it, which it sadly underbuilds both, it's not because people are suing the state, it's because the interest groups that should be advocating for rail investment the hardest uh, often object to subways and to uh, high-speed rail on green aesthetic grounds. Um, not always, because here uh, in the Trasse, Lips and Trasse, uh, the Greens are in favor and Espedes and local Espada who are needle sacks and dickheads are against. But um, in general, that is the case. For example, Berlin underbuilt urban expansion because the Greens don't care about urban expansion because they are all uh, they all live. I won't say where I live, but in general, like within the ring, uh, and they bike everywhere. Maybe take trams, so they don't care about the urban. Um, so this is something very different. This is. Um, the people who should be advocating for something don't. That's a separate political failing from the state. Can't the German state absolutely can't just decides not to. Um, and uh, the and, and if um, the Green Party were more developmental and less NIMBY, it absolutely would build. Um, they would push in the opposite direction from not building, but in favor of instead building. So we don't have death by infinite environmental reviews. In fact, that process is not at all politicized. Um, Spain is even more bureaucratic on this and not adversarial. In Spain, you have two months to say what your objections are, not just to say, I will object in a year. Um, Spain is not a place where you sue the government. Italy is not a place where you sue the government. Um, and yeah, so they, uh, they have bureaucratic standards. They have administrative standards for environmental protection, historic protection. And when I say environmental protection, I mean all environmental protection. So things like noise regulation, air pollution, water pollution, uh, risks to uh, buildings that they uh, might, uh, uh, the ground, the, in case of ground subsidence. Um, and yeah, of course, you need to study these um, when you're planning a line, but it's not a source of infinite losses. And here's the thing. China is the same on that. In China, they have environmental reviews. In China, they have uh, regulations on building subsidence and on building settlement. Uh, our collection is that the uh, limit is three centimeters of subsidence uh, is the maximum that is normally allowed. I want to say that this is the same in Western Europe. I believe in Italy it's that. I know in Italy, it, uh, shrinks from that to three millimeters in the most historically sensitive areas. So you're not going to do three centimeters of building su um, settlement um, uh, near a historic Renaissance church or a Roman ruin, but most, uh, even most of Rome is not ancient ruins or uh, or Renaissance uh, or medieval Renaissance monuments. But of course. In the areas that are, you need to be much more careful. So yes, there the construction costs are higher, like here as opposed to here, in the more recently built area. Um, but that's just Rome caring about its history. All cities do that with, I think, the exception of um, Saudi cities because the Wahhabis don't give a shit. Um, so they've turned all of the historical uh, houses of like uh, important figures in the early caliphates into um, ho hotels and shopping centers for uh, uh, for Hajj uh, for, for Hajj tourism and uh, then uh, to just 
provide as much capacity as possible for like the parts that are religiously required for Hajj. Um, and but normally places don't do that with their history. Um, Greece doesn't, Italy doesn't, Turkey doesn't. Israel doesn't, at least not deliberately. Like, um, in Israel, the, in Jerusalem specifically, the, where the, the archaeological digs are done are, is more adversarial, but, um, but again, they're not going to just bulldoze ruins. Uh, I don't think China does that either. It's just that um, Shanghai does not have anything like Roman ruins. That's just a historical fact. Um, so what they permit in China, again, it's, it seems pretty similar to what I'm saying from uh, non-English speaking Europe um, or um, Japan and South Korea, which I know about less than about Europe at this point. And, um, because, and, and, the, and, and the reason is that engineering is not political. When you let the engineers work, and yeah, I'm sure that you can, these are engineers who need to do political education uh, in, in, in school and probably find it really boring uh, and maybe think that uh, some party uh is an idiot but won't dare say that but that's the same with how the civil service interacts with politicians everywhere like technocracy does not literally mean the civil servants are an unaccountable priesthood or, or any kind of um, deep state technocracy means you let the engineers do engineering you, do, you let the Professionals do architecture, planning, um, business case reviews, environmental reviews, um, uh, historical protection reviews, and then yeah, the, poli uh, the political system makes the yes no decisions. And again, that's nothing that's available to China um, or to Russia when it's building uh, rail infrastructure. And it's equally, but in, to the exact same sense, it, it, to the exact same extent, not sense, to the exact same extent that the system is available to Nordic countries, to Germany, Italy, Poland, Czechia, France, a system that was available to the United Kingdom until I won't say until Thatcher, but I, it, but as I keep saying, British construction post history is consistent with blaming Thatcher but I want to be certain before I say that it's definitively Thatcher's fault. Um, yeah, of course. Um, Kyoto has a lot of problems with this kind of uh, archaeology, but again, that's not unique to Kyoto. Um, Thessaloniki has the same thing. They've had to slow down the metro digging because, they've, because they keep discovering archaeological uh, artifacts there. Um, same thing in Istanbul. Um, same thing in uh, same thing in uh, Mexico City. Um, Mexico City is centuries and not millennia old, but they still are finding old uh, artifacts when they do some digging there. And they're uh, I think what they're uh, so what they do is they rescue the artifacts and they show them at the stations. Why is it Thatcher's fault? Um, this question has several potential senses and I'm going to answer all of them. So um, the construction costs in the United Kingdom were showing signs of increasing in the 70s, but they were not especially high by German or Italian standards in the 1970s. They became much higher than in continental Europe in the 90s. Um, so the timeline matches not perfectly, but very well. Uh, so this is why I think it is Thatcher's fault, and the second thing is that um, seeing how the privatization of the state uh, leads to poor outcomes elsewhere, uh, the privatization of the state uh, meant that uh, there was a lot of uh, outsourcing. In so in the US, when they say outsourcing, they mean offshoring factories. In Britain, they just mean subcontracting a lot of planning artifacts to big consultancies, so uh, loss of state capacity, which yeah, it's not something that's entirely uh, maggy because some of it is just churn, um, and a lot of it is something that I would not exactly blame Thatcher herself, but the people trying to uh, build like a kind of third way, a kind of third wayism, like maybe Blair, but certainly Major, a kind of system where um, you don't 
are drowning the state in the bathtub or anything, but you do try to do public-private partnerships um, because the private sector is supposed to be more efficient. Um, essentially, the UK, Hong Kong, and Singapore learned the, the, those ideas from one another. Um, Right, I mean, um, it never had capacity to nationalize old rail operators, but okay, but the construction costs of the Victoria line were not high, neither were those of the Jubilee line. Um, I genuinely don't know British Railway related issues in that era, except I know that it was not as advanced as uh, uh, Deutsche Bundesbahn or uh, SNCF. Um, so it wasn't, so I know it had some inventions like the um, tilting train prototype. But fundamentally, the trains in, in like in let's say nineteen ninety, England were worse than in than in France where they already had um, Algevas or in Germany where they did not yet have the Itza because Itza is from nineteen ninety one, but they have the intercities um, with their time connections. Um, so yeah, with British Rail maybe it's a different story, but with um, construction costs of capital city subways. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The operate, yeah, the operations were not good. Um, but um, evidently it recovered, and it has not recovered uh, in construction costs. Um, is why I'm uh, is, is why I think that Thatcherism, if not Thatcher herself, was more focused on just cutting taxes on the rich, raising them on the poor, and uh, cutting the NHS. Um, anyway, um, are, there, are there questions? Um, uh, I don't want this to be too long. This is a tangent, this is my stream. I go on tangents, it's fine. Um, no, uh, repair, elevator and escalator repair is fine because um, it's something that's very constrained because it's just the escalator or the elevator. So it's actually at this point pretty normal to get a repair, to get a maintenance contract from the vendor. Um, and it's increasingly the same with rolling stock as well. Um, with, I don't know in the New York situation, but in Boston, when they switched to that, so they switched to having the vendor, or maybe a parallel vendor, provide the maintenance contract for the elevators. The uptime increased so much, I think it went from like low 80s to high 90s in percentage terms, so two redundant elevators before the change to uh, uh, contracting this out to the vendors themselves were less reliable than one non-redundant elevator under the current system. Uh, how did Japan become a real nation? Because it was uh, with LD, with the Liberal Democratic Party patronage. Um, yes, there was a lot of patronage, but first of all, the patronage was often to a develop to a developmental class, to to a class of developmental, let's say, uh, factory owners, uh, real estate investors, things like that, and not. Uh, um, Japan is not a country of very small businesses. It's not Italy, for example. Um, nor did it have the kind of um, license ranch situation in which uh, the idea is that uh, there are onerous business regulations, but they don't want to apply to small business. It's kind of the Indian situation. It's the Indian situation. Um, nor do I think Japan has the Italian problem of it's basically voluntary to pay VAT if you're a small business. Um, so Japan was never that kind of system. And yes, there was the patronage machine. But that's mostly a, an out of uh, capital uh, or, or out of big city things. And I mean, yeah, the, the, um, small cities in Japan are not that rail oriented. I mean, none of them is American or anything. But um, I mean, Sendai does not have the like rail usage of a European city of its size. Or, or maybe Sapporo does, but Sendai does, and Niigata doesn't. Um, Yeah, but um, is it tax exemption or tax dodging? Um, because in Italy, they don't have exemptions. In Italy, they just tax dodge. Um, so anyway, the, um, the, that's the, the situation in Japan. Um, it's just 
also just more um, like I'm not going to say full acceptance of very large cities because they are trying to decentralize a bit and the same is true in um, South Korea when they randomly move the capital functions away from Seoul to like a suburb in Gyeonggi but um, fundamentally they're much more okay with that than Europeans are. Um, yeah, fair. Legacy pirates are really key, but um, the um, but but in Tokyo, um, the metro was needed to connect them to central Tokyo. So it's not something that's entirely private. It's something where they rely they they did public private partnerships in a way, but not in what is called PPPs in the US or Canada or outsourcing in Britain. Um, like a different, like a maybe healthier assignment of what the private sector does and what the public sector does, if that makes sense. Um, and but bear, bear in mind also that in, um, like I, I don't want to, like I feel a little weird about trying to ascribe this to Japanese specific things when Korea is the same. Um, and Korea does not have legacy privates. Korea, Korea is just a state, it's just a state. Um, And even Taiwan, they all have this pattern where the ridership and on public transport in the secondary city is just not very good. Um, like Boston bad, things like that. Not Houston bad, but still. I mean, Boston is. I mean, Bostonians think of themselves as like a rail-oriented city because they compare themselves with um, with Cleveland or something. But I've never been to Cleveland. I'm not comparing Boston with Cleveland. I'm comparing, I'm comparing Boston with the cities I've lived in. No. Um, and that's like Kaohsiung or things like that, um, or Busan, um, or Sendai. Um, it's, a, it, it's a thing that uh, John William, the economist John Williamson said in response to anti-neoliberals who uh, say that uh, South Korea grew with tariffs, tariffs are fine, he says, yes, South Korea had tariffs, but South Korea fundamentally grew in the exact same way as Taiwan. Hong Kong and Singapore, so don't focus on things that South Korea did, the others didn't focus on things that all of them did together. Um, like again, suppressing consumption, um, having a very, having a test-based educational meritocracy to the point that um, to get ahead, you need education. So yeah, they have an elite and the, and um, I know in Singapore they don't have very high income ability. Um, I think South Korea has some, but like not Nordic levels or anything like that. But even if you're expected to be hereditary elite, you need to fucking pass your tests. Um, and to be clear, uh, a grade that begins with a consonant is not a pass in, like, in this kind of environment. Like in Singapore, I mean, they don't know whether the grades use letters in uh, South Korea. Oh, yeah, that. I mean, yeah, but they still have, like, my understanding is that Japan and Korea don't have great income mobility. Um, in, I know that in Singapore they just don't, um, but Singapore also has disgusting inequality in Japan and Korea. Um, which, again, I kind of like focusing on the common things and not the difference, which is why I, I mean, I, I talked a little bit about socialism, but it's not really a matter of inequality, not when... Um, we're seeing very high usage of public transportation in Singapore, but also in Switzerland, um, to uh, Sweden. No, uh, Singapore is not better than Anglos. Maybe Japan and Korea are. Singapore has higher. Yeah. So in Singapore, it, Singapore does not have data in the Luxembourg income study, um, but it has its own data on uh, strata, like economic strata and inequality. And uh, I believe the number that they use is uh, income from, I think they use the same numbers as the US on this. So uh, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they use the same numbers as the US. Uh, so uh, household income, uh, I think it's only income from work, but it's pre, it's kind of weird that they use that they 
maybe I, I don't remember if it's labor, if both countries are using labor income for this, or uh, if they're using income from all sources, including government transfers, but before taxes, um, which is the weird thing, because usually you do inequality, either market income or income after taxes and transfers. And uh, Singapore, before taxes, is about comparable to the United States, and the United States has higher and more progressive taxes. Um, yeah, Singapore is not the issue. Singapore is not a very aggressive property tax base. The issue in Singapore is they just don't have a welfare state, and they uh, have low income taxes, um, and like no labor empowerment whatsoever. Like strikes are illegal. But anyway, are there questions about infrastructure and not about uh, um, Singapore trying to uh, maximize inequality in a developed country? And I say not trying. They are the most unequal developed sovereign state. Like Hong Kong, if it counts as a country, is about comparable, but Hong Kong is, as we have seen in the last five years, not a sovereign state. Start to do this, um, sorry about the back there. Um, these costs don't show any kind of autocratic efficiency or Chinese efficiency. Like these numbers in China are, um, like if anything, again, a little higher in Europe, uh, higher, th higher in China than in Europe because they, uh, because they uh, build on viaducts and not earthworks when it's not uh, in a tunnel. And most of China is not in a tunnel. Um, and we can kind of see the light going away in the background. So are there questions? And again, we don't have that much lag, so I'm not going to wait three minutes um, for people to type. Thank you for watching. Um, yeah, so thank you all for watching on a not th not that much of a prior notice. Um, yeah, thank you. Have um, have lovely days too, all of you guys. Thank you and uh, ciao.